Retro Hangover, supported via Patreon by listeners like you. We would especially like to thank patrons Lyle McCarns, Ashton Ruby, Randall Quiggle, Tony G, Stunt Still Smash the Milkman, Katie Quigg, Paul Romalo, Raging Demon JC, Megan Caruso, Mast Keaton, Andrew Laguori, Ozzy Garcia, The Retro Vixen, Adam from The Good, The Bad, The Backlog, Thunderdome Gaming Society, Disky Mera, Jenny E, Rick Firestone, Parallax Puddles, Soha, Keith Gasper, Dave Jack. Jackson, Eric Guess, Kayla Jackson, Nomad from the Retro Wildlands Podcast, Ash Event, Alan Bingham, Storm Beagle, Ryan Player One, and Mike the Rep from Backbreaker Gaming. Your continued engagement and generous donations are deeply appreciated. Open your ears and crack some beers. You are listening to the most recent episode of Retro Hangover. Classic gamers, welcome to the podcast where we spin splattery, sullenly seeking salacious supplies of spoops. This is Retro Hangover. I am your co-host, Chris Copleen, with, as always, your host, Shane. Totally not Jason Dick Dragon-Kos! Of all of my supplies of spoops, I have to say that the salacious ones are the most salacious. Yeah, sure. I was trying to think of another <laughs> S word on the fly. My brain just went, nope. Scrumptious. Yes, most most scrumptious. There you go. They're the most scrumptious spoops. Scrumptiously salacious spoops. You know why it's awesome talking about spoops? Hmm. It's because it's October and it's Spooptober and you're going to get a bunch of games that are spoopy this month as we do every year. My favorite time of year. Yes. It starts to get chilly here in Florida with a nice cool 78 degrees by the end of the month. Can't wait. (laughs) I said by the end of the month. Yeah. It's still going to be like 90 next week. It's, It's still like really kind of depressing to me that kids have to go trick or treating in like fucking swimsuits or some shit here because it's still just like yeah it's halloween go outside and get candy it's still 80 two things about that one i don't think kids trick-or-treat anymore i haven't seen them trick-or-treat in like forever it's been at least a decade we had some last year really that's yeah. interesting i mean it was huh. it was literally just the kids in our neighborhood but that that was it that makes sense the other thing is and this has nothing to do with kids is that the, the warmer weather allows for the people I am attracted to, the, the women of the world, mm. to dress in even skimpier outfits for Halloween, which I'm all about. Let your freak <laughs> flag fly. Enjoy yourself. If you got it, flaunt it. Wear whatever the hell you want to. I fully support the skimpiest of Halloween slutty outfits for my, your entertainment, your, <laughs> your enjoyment. Ah, uh, yes, the unnecessary sexy versions of every single costume okay i can't wait i need to i need to see me a good like sexy waluigi i think that could happen i i definitely think if i get if i get enough muscles if that ever happens and i'm going to the gym lately so that could happen there you go i I doubt it because i eat like shit and i drink a ton (laughs) but if that does happen i will run around in a purple speedo and a purple hat with an upside down L, put on a mustache and flex for everybody. There you go. Just run up to houses and just be like, trick or wah. Exactly. I don't have to worry about frostbite getting on the tip of my penis either, like I did when I was growing up in Chicago, because it'll be like 80. Yeah. Yeah. There, there you go. Yeah. You know what? You, you've completely changed my mind on this topic. Con- congratulations, Chris. You've, you- you did it. You're welcome. And for our, <laughs> everyone else in the world, outside the United States, when I say 80, I really mean like 25, 30, I think. I think that's what it is. Yeah, what, whatever your weird Celsius measurements are. We, we measure yes. everything in freedom units over here. So Freedom. That's right. That's F for freedom. That's, that's, that's not an eagle. But. <laughs> 
So before we get into today's game, which is Splatterhouse, a nice little game for your TurboGrafx-16 or arcade, however you want to live your life, uh, we like to talk about the games we have been playing lately. We don't have a guest, so one of us has to go first. Shit. But sh- yeah, I know. Uh, Shane, you usually go before me, so let's just keep that trend going in the very least. So uh, what have you been playing lately? Damn it. Now I can't rely on a third party to make our content interesting. What am I going to do? Shit. Uh, <laughs> let's see. What have I been playing? Really just two things primarily, I think. I've actually had a little bit more free time in the past like week-ish than I have in recent memory, uh, which is nice. So I've been able to actually kind of lean into finishing up the the main story quests for Star Rail, which has been a long time coming. I've been behind on that to the point where there are some like limited time events happening right now that are gated behind you having to finish a certain point of the main story. And that I, honestly, that was actually part of my motivator to finally fucking just finish it. Cause I was just like, I want to do this event, but I can't. So, um, so I've had enough free time that I actually could just sink some time into that, which has been nice. I really do still like that game. It's a really great turn-based RPG and the visuals are fantastic. I'll be curious to see what happens with that, given this whole Unity debacle happening right now, because as far Yuck. as I'm aware, Hoyo, basically all of their games, this Genshin Impact, all this is built on Unity. So uh, that should be interesting. I've been playing that one and uh, I've been putting a decent amount of time into Dismantle. If you happen to watch, well, at the time of this recording, the last Sunday stream that I did. That is what I played, and uh, I'm really enjoying it. It's like a more arcadey kind of uh, Project Zomboid. So if you, y'all out there are familiar with that, like my friends tried to get me into Project Zomboid, and it's just it's too fiddly for me. Like it's trying too hard to be like a hardcore simulation of trying to survive a zombie apocalypse in a isometric 2D viewpoint. And so I just never really it never really hooked me like it did with them. But like, I get it like there's with the fiddliness of it comes a lot of like customizability, like you can set up your own server, you can customize the rules and blah, blah, blah. And that's cool. But I'm just not that big into the sim aspects of those types of games or really any types of games. So Dismantle is way more my speed because it's much more video gamey, like it's a little more arcadey sort of the same idea but the general like gist of it is you're a dude in the zombie apocalypse and you have a trusty crowbar and you that crowbar you can pretty much break down almost any object in the world for crafting materials and you can upgrade the crowbar so you can break more shit so eventually you just roll up into an abandoned house and just crowbar the fuck out of a refrigerator and suddenly you have metal scraps and wiring which is great and that's kind of the main like loop is really just breaking shit that you find getting crafting materials, upgrading your gear and your new skills and all that stuff. And, and there's like actual quests, which is a big thing for me because like the directionless sandbox stuff doesn't work for me. Having very clear quests of like, you need to find these radio towers and you need to do this and blah, blah is really helpful for me to kind of stay motivated. Yeah, I've been really enjoying it. I actually really recommend it. I know some people have commented about it being a little boring um, because the crafting grind gets a little intense, but I kind of like it because it's a very pick up and play sort of game. And I don't really have to think about too much as far as like, where did I leave off? Like, I just kind of pick up where I left off and just keep exploring and just bust up some shit with a crowbar. So. So I'm liking it at any rate. Those are the two main ones that have been kind of keeping me busy outside of show and or guest spot related items. So uh, <laughs> but what about you, Chris? What, what's what been keeping you occupied? I have continued to play Sea of Stars, mm. which uh, for for like the first eight hours or so, I would, I would put it if I had to give like a numerical value to it, mm. I put it around seven, seven and a half, which is still a good game. Like yeah. there's still a lot of good qualities. Uh, the timing mechanics weren't something I was getting into. Some of the dungeon designs wasn't something I was really appreciating. Like you would get to a point in a dungeon 
and you'd be like, ah, I'm just going to see what happens if I go in this direction because I don't know which way I want to go. Because, you know, in, in RPG fashion, if you go the wrong direction, there's usually treasure there. If you go the right direction, that means story progression. And in a lot of old 16, 32 bit RPGs, story progression usually meant that you couldn't go back and get that treasure. Mm. Uh, sea of Stars does that from time oh, to time. My favorite. Yeah. There's no missable items because you can go back. But going back is kind of a pain in the ass. But aside from that, I've kind of made it to a point in the game where I'm I wouldn't say getting used to the mechanics, but it feels like everything is just starting to come together. The enemies aren't as punishing. There's more resources that that do more for me. I don't feel as defenseless. I'm having a better time. The way that the game is presenting it to me feels a little bit more fair and it's getting easier so maybe it is getting used to mechanics maybe it's just the the game design itself and the pacing is just getting a hell of a lot better i think that has a lot to do with it Mm. this is starting to shape up to be a game i really really like so we'll see how it finish it off finishes off uh, all around i'm i I am enjoying it i am planning on doing a guiden for the game i just don't know who else i'm going to have on that yet but i'm thinking that this is going to perhaps make my top five games of this year Wow. I don't know. It's it's really you know, it's really close. And I don't really have a lot of games I've played this year. I'm super high on save about like two or three. So making the top five isn't exactly a huge competition at the moment, but it's it's working <laughs> okay. its way up there. <laughs> That's interesting, because I thought you were going to go the other direction with that and say that it started out as a seven out of ten. And now it's like a four Because like I've I've yeah. been anecdotally seeing people kind of saying that, that they're just like, eh, this isn't as good as I thought it was going to be. but. It's good to hear that, you know, that's not everybody's take. I've seen two camps where some people are like, this game just feels off and it's not all there. And then I've seen some people who, since they fire up that game, they're just heads over heel in love with it. Mm -hmm. So there's there's not a lot of in between. I know that's a very cliche thing to say, but that's what I'm seeing right now with Sea of Stars. And somehow I'm that one of those people that I just said don't exist, but I'm leaning towards the. (laughs) Yeah, it's okay, but. I'm starting more along the lines of I think it's very, very good, if not great. But I'm not like, I don't know, uh, defending it left and right. Like, I do realize there's flaws with it. Sure. I'm not going to sit here and just say it's an infallible creation because, yeah, it it does have some short fallings. I I don't particularly care for, but I don't know. There's still plenty of game left. And well, I'm probably not because I'm about 15 hours in 16 and the game's supposed to be about 2025. So maybe I'm towards the end. Let's see. Well, you know what uh, definitely doesn't take you that many hours? The game that we're Spider talking House. about today. <laughs> <laughs> it does not. Not at all. This game is a it's a nice, neat little package. Mm. Just just like myself, I, I should say. But <laughs> we're not talking about the brief history of your small package co-host right here. We're talking about the brief history of Splatterhouse. And Shane, I know that October is your favorite month of the year. So I think that if we're going to give a brief history over a spoopy game, you should be the one to do it. Normally, this would be about the time that we'd have a brief history of the development of the game du jour ready for you. However, The information on development for Splatterhouse is rather sparse. So let's fill you in with some basic details instead. The game was developed and published by Namco for Japanese arcades in November of 1988. North America and Europe saw releases the following March, which as we all know is definitely the spoopiest time of the year. The release was somewhat successful, especially in Japan, where it was the sixth most popular arcade game in December of 88. Being a successful arcade game, Splatterhouse would inevitably be ported to a home console. That console would be the PC Engine, or as we call it here, the TurboGrafx-16 in 1990. The port was incredibly faithful to the arcade version and received positive reviews at the time, 
However, the North American version had to be heavily censored and altered due to the Dungeons & Dragons fueled satanic panic holdover of the late 1980s. NEC did not have the same courage as Sega in separating themselves from Nintendo, so they caved to the pressure. The TurboGrafx-16 version of Splatterhouse was later released to the Wii Virtual Console in 2009, but it received mostly negative reviews. Critics essentially stated that it had not aged well in the slightest, while also electing to use the North American version over the Japanese one. Splatterhouse was successful enough to spawn several sequels, including a spin-off for the Nintendo Famicom. There would also be a remake for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 released in 2010, which included three games in the franchise. And that is your very brief history of Splatterhouse. All right, thank you, Shane. You know what's interesting, and and I'm kind of kind of allude to a later patron pontification because mm. they said they they saw an arcade cabinet, but I have never, ever seen an arcade cabinet for Splatterhouse. Have you? Nope. I I have never spotted one of these in the wild. I did not even know it was an arcade game until much much later in life. One thing I do kind of want to talk about here in, in the brief history because a lot of people might be thinking, why would a successful arcade game in Japan be ported to the Turbo Graphics 16. And we've we've kind of talked about this on our Sega episode before and maybe some other episodes. But if you didn't know, the Sega Genesis was horrifically treated in Japan. It did not sell well. No one cared for it. Sonic the Hedgehog didn't even help out that much over there. So if you were a Japanese company, chances were you're going to probably port your game to the Turbo Graphics or PC Engine. And the Super Nintendo wasn't out yet. So that's that's why you see Splatterhouse on it, I would imagine. And Splatterhouse 2 and 3 did come out on the Genesis. So there is that. But we're not talking about them today. Right. There you go. A little, a little bit more history. There you go. This is so brief. <laughs> we did kind of segue in there before I started going off on the little tangent about personal experiences. Mm. So aside from the arcade cabinet from which we both know neither of us experienced before, in our entire lives. Mm. Uh, what, do you have any other personal experience with the game Splatterhouse? Very, very little. I think I tried to play it on emulation years ago just because, I mean, I mean, let's let's be honest. It's, it's mostly the artwork. Yeah. I am nothing if not a self-proclaimed edgelord or at least a teenage edgelord who's trying to pretend to be a functional adult. I don't know. But at any rate, that shit is still like a fucking magnet for me. So seeing like the the badass artwork with the dude in the Jason hockey mask and just all the zombies and body horror. And I was like, man, I don't know what this is, but I got to check it out. And I played it for like maybe five or ten minutes it was like shit dog this game is hard as fuck and (laughs) that was that was it that was that was my whole experience that is interesting by the way it's not jason because his mask is purple oh yeah well that depends on what version you're playing it does depend but what version did you play for this one uh so i played the uh, arcade archives version on my switch which is a port of the original arcade oh is that like an original game on the Switch? You can buy that on your Switch? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like six or seven oh. bucks. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. I did not know that. Okay. I played the TurboGraph. I played the PC Engine version of this game. I did mm. not play the TurboGrafx-16 version. I don't have a physical copy of that either. Uh, so yes, my, my Jason mask, my totally not Jason mask was white. So it looked more like a white Jason hockey mask. But my personal experience is actually pretty fleshed out here for quite an obscure game. Huh. So... Yeah, I think I've talked about this location in the past on the show before, but in case this is your first time on our show, I'll, I'll kind of do a brief summary. From about third to fifth grade, I had an after school, I want to say sitter. It was she was she was kind of like a babysitter for a bunch of kids that we would go after school, after school care. But it wasn't like a business. It's kind of like a brick and mortar or anything it was at, at her house. Mm-hmm. And they had a TurboGrafx-16 and Splatterhouse was one of the games that they had. <laughs> What are the most How old fitting? Were you? you know, this is this is not relevant. Actually, isn't <laughs> entirely relevant. 
I was just about to say, like, what is the best game you could possibly give a bunch of, you know, eight, nine, ten year olds oh. is mm. <laughs> is a gory and violent a horror game where you're chasing, killing monsters and splattering them all over the wall with you know horrific imagery. I think Splatterhouse is a, a perfect game for a well-adjusted eight year old. I, I can see no flaws with that. No, it is amazing. All the things that we watched and, and saw when we were kids and a lot of the things we kind of turn our nose on for kids watching nowadays. It's um, it's awesome. <laughs> uh. But yeah, I played a lot of it back then. I think I had a physical copy when I got my Turbo Express later on and continued to play it there. But I didn't play it in between uh, for a long time. But it's just one of those games I did play a lot when I was younger. So I do have a lot of memories of this. There is some muscle memory, which makes the first couple stages relatively easy for me now just because I have played it so much and know a lot of the tricks later stages are still hard as balls don't worry we'll talk about that but yeah I I I really did love this game it's a significant game uh and it was a lot of fun except okay and here here's something I want to go into really quick here does it seem to you that like there is an odd amount of people who know what Splatterhouse is, considering it was on a system that no one owned, and it was on an arcade cabinet that no one's seen, save like two people. Yeah, it, it is strange, actually, how this game seems to have like permeated the the general like social consciousness. I'm not. I, I guess it's maybe just the the shock factor. I feel like that has to be a big part of it. That people are just like, oh yeah, that. That game, the one that looks like a '80s slasher movie, and it's super gory. Like, but yeah, they don't necessarily know much more beyond that. I think that's that's probably it. But you say Splatterhouse, and yeah, it's weird. Like you say Splatterhouse, people know it's a video game. Mm-hmm. If you're talking to gamers, and you say other TurboGrafx-16 games, they they give you a funny face. So I just <laughs> I think that's really fantastic that this game is known. Probably people more think about Splatterhouse 2 for the Genesis, which would make a lot more sense. But I don't think anyone bought that either. So, yeah, it's it's really weird. Yeah, it, it is strange. But I mean, when you do have a game like this that is so striking in it's I'm going to go with generally uncompromising visual presentation. Yeah, I think it it will stick with people. Oh, especially for 1990. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. for sure. It's it's definitely more detailed than Castlevania. Yes. But let's get into the plot of this game, which is fairly simple, given that this game is a, you know, just 2D action game, scrolling action game. You are Rick. I forgot what your last name is. I'm just going to say Firestone because he's a good dude. <laughs> I mean, and it's you... Taylor, but we can go with Firestone if you like. OK, we'll just say Rick Firestone for this. OK, uh, sh- <laughs> shout out to uh, Pixel Project Radio. So you're Rick Firestone with his girlfriend, Jennifer, and there's a storm. And uh, in order to seek refuge from the storm, you decide to run into the local spooky haunted mansion that everyone knows is spooky and haunted. And uh, you're, you're trying to seek refuge and you get captured. You get knocked unconscious. And when you wake up, you find yourself with this ancient Aztec mask, which looks like a modern hockey mask for some reason, which also happens to be sentient and attaches to yourself like Venom. And then you go off and try to rescue your girlfriend. I think that's a pretty good plot synopsis, uh, if I do say so myself. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much the gist. Yeah, I suppose if people want to know more about the the lore of, of Splatter House, then the house <laughs> yeah. that you go into is is known as the it's the West Mansion, named after Doctor West, who lived there. And the reason that the folks in in the surrounding town and stuff know it as the Splatter House is largely just based on rumors of just like really gnarly experiments that were allegedly conducted by said Dr. West, who is apparently a parapsychologist and also is mysteriously missing at this particular time. Hmm. And yeah, so you take refuge with your girlfriend. You're both university students. Of course. And you take refuge there. And then, uh, yeah, you Rick wakes up. In a dungeon and the terror mask, which is a is a uh, a Mayan sacrificial artifact. I'm sorry. I said Aztec. Not, yeah, I mean, not, it's, it's, it's Mayan. You know, it's 
close ish. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Mayan sacrificial artifact and it is in fact sentient and it attaches to you basically on the premise of like, Hey, like I'm going to turn you into this of like supernatural beast man, beast of a dude, not literally a beast man, but just a, a big ass jacked dude with supernatural strength to avenge, you know, find slash avenge your girlfriend. But you're not a hundred percent on the masks motivations, really. It's just kind of like, yeah, just just do this. I think the implication and it's funny because like I'm going to I want to talk about this a little bit, probably maybe later, but. At, at some point, we should totally do an episode on the Splatterhouse remake because that was done in oh, yeah. 2010 now. So it's definitely uh, it qualifies. definitely qualifies for the show. It's an interesting take uh, or a reboot uh, on Splatterhouse, but they, they flesh out some of that stuff. But I think the implication flesh. here is that the mask is really just yearning for blood and you are the vessel with which it will provide said blood. Yeah, it's very cool. I like I like all of that. Did I not say West Mansion? I thought I saw West Mansion. No, you just That's said the, the local spoopy house. Oh, I thought I said West Mansion. But yes, it is the West Mansion. It sounds like they took a lot of inspiration from from Crowley. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Directly lifted from that, which I know is in the supernatural area. But you could say that about a lot of mansions and other sp- spooky people like Crowley, Elon Musk, Ozzy, Os- <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne, you know, those those types. Well, I think one of the the great things about this game is just how, you know, how much it wears its inspirations directly on its sleeve. You know, I mean, it's it. I mean, yes. it's it's borderline copyright infringement, I guess. But <laughs> but I mean, like you know, Friday the Thirteenth and Halloween and like all of the the classic like eighties slasher films. Like a lot of that is present here. A lot of like. H.R. Giger esque, uh, like body horror yeah. type stuff. Like it, it's it's all there. Yeah, and without entirely lifting from Giger, which right. a lot of people tried to do, and they didn't do that. They had some inspiration, but they really went more towards the the body horror from Slasher Fix, which mm-hmm. I I genuinely appreciate. And we'll talk about that in graphics, of course. Uh, what I do like about the plot is the twist that it has near the end, mm-hmm. which is not typical of a video game during this time. And is genuinely disturbing, uh, which relates to the outcome of the person you are looking for. I don't know if we should spoil it. I mean, fuck it. We'll spoil it. You fight. You fight your girlfriend and she turns into a a horrific monster. And I love that twist because in almost every other game, you end up saving your girlfriend. You end up saving the damsel in distress. And in this one, she becomes a monster that can definitely kick your ass. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you you end up going into a room where you see like a good half dozen or so of these zombie ish kind of creatures hovering around this like chaise lounge or couch or whatever. And once you show up, they kind of disperse and she's just laying there and then she gets up and you're like, you're thinking at first, you're like, oh, man, I, I saved her. I did it. And then she starts screeching. And dude, the. It's still, I mean, we're kind of going into graphics a little bit, I guess here, but that, Mm -hmm. that point is just like, even, even as a, just a 2d game, that transformation from Jennifer, your girlfriend into this fucking disgusting creature with talons and like ripped open flesh and stuff is that is gnarly as shit. Even today. (laughs) It's so cool. A good turnabout. Yeah, the sound direction here, too. The fact that she says some of the things that like, oh, help me before mm-hmm. she does that. Oh, that's so good. But that's really the most amount of plot development you get in the entire game is, is well, that what about what about the uh, what about the ending ending? Ooh, I'm not I'm not sure because I did play the turbo graphics and in that one, the mask just explodes. Right. And you see you see a weird face. And after you defeat the final boss and like everything just exits, I think the, the mansion lights on fire. Mm hmm. And that's about it. Yeah. So, I mean, towards so towards the end. Yeah, you you so you kind of find out that the the mansion is essentially alive and that's part of like what is spawning all of these creatures, because to get to the last level, you basically jump down this big flesh hole, which is great. Oh, yeah. And you fight the fetuses. Yep. You fight a bunch of fetuses and then you fight what is apparently supposed to be the womb of the house. And once that is defeated and explodes into viscera you basically exit and set the whole damn place on fire but then there's there's one last battle that you have to have where the the mask 
basically, I, I won't say resurrects, but like essentially, so well, I guess it probably would have been in a way because I think the implication, you can keep me on track here if you know better, but that last mm. part where you, you go to that grave, which that, by the way, that's one of the things that got censored in the home console version is the arcade version has like a wooden cross like grave marker and then they change that to just like a stone like slab in the uh home console but yeah but at any rate you you go there and the mask like projects this energy into this grave and it summons this giant ass flesh demon thing with arms that are like as big as like a quarter of the screen like trying to swat at you and you have to punch it in the head a bunch of times And then after that, when you finally defeat this last thing, which I think is technically called something stupid like Hell Chaos, it's one of those great (laughs) like early 90s like translation names. Yeah, Hell Chaos. Once you kill that thing, the the last like the, the ending of the arcade version, at least you see the mask shatter and then Rick is basically just leaving this area with the the burning mansion in the background. You get the credits to roll. Once the credits finish rolling, there's the the surprise, the, the Marvel surprise ending where the camera pans down to the shards of the mask and it all reassembles and there's like this demonic laugh and then it says end. So like the implication is that like the mask is still very much there, very much sentient and ready to take another victim. So, yeah, that doesn't happen in the end of the TurboGrafx-16. You see the, the mansion on fire. And you see the credits roll and then it just says end. Right. There's there's no mask. It's interesting yeah. that they took that out. I'm curious as to what like the rationale for that was, because it seems like a it was simultaneously a very important and then sort of like totally not important thing to change, if that makes sense. Like it could be really important because it effectively changes the implication of the ending of the game. But then at the same time, like it's not really a huge thing to cut at the end of the day like i don't feel like it was cut yeah. for like space saving purposes or something i don't know they may not have thought they were going to make a sequel by the time the arcade ports released maybe on, on the turbo graphics 16 and because probably in 1988 they're like oh we're going to make a sequel and this was released just like two years almost two years after the arcade game right so they may have not thought like sequels in the works they just had the mask shatter that's possible possible yeah but we have spent a lot of time <laughs> on the plot of this game which it doesn't really communicate to you well outside those few scenes. So good on you, Splatterhouse, for having an interesting plot to to have us talk about for as long as we have compared to <laughs> other games. Surprisingly longer game. than we thought. Surprisingly longer. All right, let's get into the gameplay here. I'll let you start on this. What did, what did you think of how this game played? Uh, okay, so at first, and I remember thinking this the first time I attempted to play this game like years ago. It feels kind of stiff, mm. but there so there's a couple of things that I think factor into that that could possibly be the reason why I thought that and then why I don't necessarily think that anymore. And that is because I know the first time I tried to play this game, I was playing the console version, like the turbo mm-hmm. graphics version. When I played the arcade version this time. I didn't really think that and it could be a version difference or it honestly just could be me. Like maybe I just feel differently about it (laughs) since the last time I played it. But I think by and large, the game actually seems to control pretty well. It's responsive enough. I mean, it's not exactly complicated, you know, so it's really just walk to the left and the right, jump and then attack uh, and Mm -hmm. crouch down to pick up weapons that are on the ground for you to use. And that's essentially it. There's some, I guess, extra things you can do, like a slide dive kick if you want to do that. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. And I found it to be found it to be good. Actually, it was very responsive. Um, my issues with the gameplay have nothing to do with how the game controls or even really any like mechanics. I think it's just uh-huh. it's it's the arcadey nature of it in that it is it is purposefully oh, difficult. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) like it's it's bullshit difficulty, which you can overcome much in the same way that, you know, I'm good at Contra three. This is very much that style of a game where like if you if you play it enough times, it's all about pattern recognition. So once you get that down, you're going to be good at this game like there. It just it'll happen. Mm -hmm. But there is a very serious difficulty curve. It's more like a difficulty 
cliff, I think, in that just like sight unseen going into this cold, I was able to finish, I think, the first almost two levels without too much difficulty. I got like into, agree, yeah. into the third level, not all the way through, but into the third level without too much of a, of a problem. After that, like all bets were kind of off <laughs> as far <laughs> as that goes. And I was even playing on the easy difficulty like option, which as far as I know, really only just gives you more hits before you die. I think instead of like the D de- what's the default like four, I think on the console version, it's five. OK, I think the arcade might be four. I'm not sure, but I'd have to double check. But I know that turning it to easy mode gives you something like, I don't know, six or seven hearts or something. So you, you can take way more hits. And even with the that like extra leeway, it gets real frustrating. <laughs> so I played the, the console version. There's a lot of similarities to, to what you just said. I don't think that the game itself gets exceptionally difficult or exceptionally hard in the console version which i think is a good thing but it's a short game so might not be a great thing if you spent 50 dollars on it in 1990 of course but i would also agree that the first two levels are rather simplistic and Mm. that's where the controls i think are fine because they are they are very basic you have a jump button you have an attack button and you do have a variety of attacks that you can do like if you do jump in the air and you press down and kick, it does extend your attack with a, like a down kick, like a jump kick. It's a little hard to pull off because, as you said, the controls are so stiff. And also turning around and, and doing a punch can take some time, which is more important in later levels, uh, especially with the mirror enemy, the one that comes out of the mirror, because there's kind of a set pattern as to what they do. And you have to be very precise and you have to be very deliberate in your button presses in order to execute some of the maneuvers you have to do in order to avoid attacks that that's kind of where the bullshit is but the first two levels you don't really need to memorize them you can go in they're very reactionary they're something that almost any player of any skill level you've been playing video games for a while can just go in there and have a good time with and the controls even though they're stiff the simplicity and the simplicity of the level layout really complement each other in a very straightforward kind of way that I really do appreciate. The bullshit that you mentioned is very much is very much you know presented to you in stage 3. And the reason why stage 3 is such bullshit and this is where the game lets you know that it's not going to fuck around. I think stage 3 is the hardest stage for this reason. You get a shotgun in the beginning of the level. That's one of the weapons you get. Mm-hmm. And you know there's other weapons of course. There's there's the plank There's a wrench that you can throw. There's a stone you can throw and there's a cleaver. But this level, you get a shotgun and you're going to think, oh, I have a shotgun. This is cool. I'm going to use the shotgun. You're not supposed to use the shotgun. You're (laughs) supposed to carry the shotgun all the way to the end of the level. Oh, and by the way, you're not supposed to fall through these holes that are in the middle of the level because you fall through. You also lose the shotgun. So you have to avoid the obstacles, carry the shotgun to the end of the level. Then you run into another shotgun. And then you have to essentially juggle the shotgun until you get to the boss, which is a chainsaw man. And your shotgun has eight shells in it. And in order to kill the chainsaw man, you need to shoot him 10 times. That's why you need both shotguns, because if you try to attack chainsaw man normally with your attacks, you're going to get slaughtered unless you're really fucking good at this game. So that's an example of the bullshit. Like you have to carry this all the way. And if you make it there, the boss is incredibly easy because the shotgun will just rip right through him. But if you don't have a shotgun, you're dead. And it's pretty much game over at that point, which sucks. Yeah. Other than that, I didn't think it was too bad. Yeah. I mean, that that particular thing is is definitely unfair because there's zero way that you would know how to handle that situation without trial and error. Like you you have to right. fail at least once to figure that out. And granted. It is possible. It is possible to defeat him without just using the shotgun. I actually ended up doing that because I I didn't realize I needed both shotguns. And so I had the second one that they give you because I used up the first one because like any normal person, like you said, when you get into that level and you see a shotgun on the ground, you're just like, fuck, yeah, I'm going to shoot some things. (laughs) That's fucking so right. (laughs) <laughs> so I just immediately used it. Yeah. And then like I saw a second one once I got through the level and I was like, all right, cool, cool. 
this will be helpful on the boss. And then I emptied all eight shells into him and he was still alive. And I was like, well, fuck. <laughs> Cause like the two, his, he, his arms are literally just two giant chainsaws. And if you try to get anywhere near him, he will just slice you up. Now it is possible cause I managed to do it. But again, I took a good, like at least four hits to make this happen, but you can like jump kick him or get a good punch in if you're careful to finish off those last couple of hits that you need if you didn't juggle the shotguns to bring both of them but it is definitely difficult and so you are absolutely punished for like not knowing that that's what you're supposed to do that i think to me is probably the one thing in the whole game and i mean there's only seven stages so yeah there's not a ton here but out of all seven stages i think that's the one thing that i would point to is just being like okay this this is really not great design like forcing the care the the player to fail in order to figure out what you want them to do here without any hint is not fantastic i think outside of that like i said it's it is really just about that pattern recognition and figuring out how best to i don't want to say cheese but it is really just figuring out how to cheese encounters the haunted room boss where it's like the poltergeist it's just like throwing shit around yeah like there is a specific spot that you can stand like towards the right side of the room where you basically can avoid just about everything that's being thrown around, which is really the hardest part. Cause that first part you get into that room and everything starts shaking stuff starts dropping from the ceiling that you don't see until it materializes and then drops out of nowhere. And so like it's chaos at the beginning of that fight. So it's really hard to like really hone in on, okay, where, where should I be to not be taking unnecessary damage but once you get through that i think the rest of the encounter is not bad like you just need to time punching or kicking the the various objects that are getting thrown at you sort of like one after another and once you nail down that pattern it's it's not too difficult although i think later in the game one, once you get to like that section with the womb and the the embryos and stuff it's it gets to a point where you start just getting like overwhelmed and if you're not super, super quick on the trigger with like turning around and punching or kicking behind you or trying to dodge like several different things bouncing around at you at the same time, like you're you're going to die a lot. Like, I think it's it takes a lot of practice to get that figured out. Yeah, I would point out, too, after that stage three, I didn't I don't remember stage four being particularly bad. I actually like the boss of that, too, where you fight the upside down cross unless you're playing the North American version <laughs> with the meat cleaver. I thought that was cool. Right. But like stage five, I think it was stage five gets irritating when you have to jump over the pits with the hands in them. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think it's fair, but it's, it's irritating. Uh, where it really irritated me too was, I think it's still stage five, still stage five here where you are walking through this hallway and you have these ghosts that are coming out of the walls that you have to attack, but you also have these ghosts overhead that you can't touch who drop skulls when they're right above you. And then you also have holes in the floor and there's not a lot of room to move around. So you're either taking a hit or you're falling through the hole in the floor, which leads to a more difficult area than if you had just jumped up and taken the stairs up. So there's a couple of of instances of that in stage stage five, which are extremely irritating. Stage six. uh, What I'm extremely thankful for in stage six is I played this game on the Turbo Graphics 16 or with the Turbo Controller because I had the Turbo Switches. So if you're playing that with the Turbo Switch, you can just hold down the button and, and Rick is just going to rapidly punch or rapidly kick anything in front of him. So you don't have to time those attacks when those little fetuses try to jump and molest you. Mm. The other thing is, too, is if especially in that level, especially the the womb level, the fetuses that drop down from the ceiling, if they're on the left hand of the screen, you can just push them off the screen and they die. They, they don't regenerate. They don't come back. That's another tactic used. Oh, they definitely do in the arcade version. Yeah, there's more memory, more memory for your <laughs> harassment and pleasure. Right. That's something you can also do. But that boss, the, the womb boss or whatever you want to call it, that looks like a heart. Mm-hmm. It does not look like a womb. That is the weirdest looking womb I've ever seen in my life. But those little fetuses just don't stop coming out. Nope. And you will have to stop and turn around and attack them. And because the controls are so stiff and like you have to be so precise, you could com- get completely screwed trying to attack a little fetus, trying to kill it, miss the fetus, then have to go do another attack while they spawn like a million other fetuses to go fly at you. So like some of those instances, they they feel cheap. But again, I think you made a very important point earlier, and I've, I've said it as well. 
this is not to the point where you cannot learn what to do. Right. With, aside from stage three, the game is exceptionally fair. I also like that the final level, you don't fight anything. It's just avoiding shit. Oh, yeah. Well, that that is a lot of just learning the timing, like having those fiery yeah. logs and then like the fire elementals or whatever bouncing around everywhere like that's yeah it's a bit of a gauntlet but yeah i guess at least you don't have to fight anything i will say one of the other little fun facts about the censorship changes is that level i think it's stage five you're talking about where you have to jump over the pits with the severed hands yeah one of the like sort of idle animations that they have in the arcade version is the hands will just flip you off oh that's awesome that's not in the <laughs> console version that's not in the pc engine version either yeah no they, cool. they took that out but in the arcade version yeah they'll just sit there and just give you the finger <laughs> <laughs> oh that's cool i also love how the final boss isn't all that hard i think that's a nice little reward there the final level is actually not hard at all yeah no and, and i i'm always a fan of like the big like screen filling bosses it's, it's part of why i like contra 3 so much is because they oh yeah lean into that quite a bit and this kind of give gives that same vibe like i said you get those giant zombie ghoul hands coming up out the bottom of the screen trying to grab at you and stuff it's not that bad but overall i think What I'll say just to encapsulate the gameplay is, yes, it's stiff and it makes it difficult later on, but this isn't something that's going to be too overly difficult to understand. Just controls are simple. I still don't know how to execute that stupid slide, but this is this is something pretty much anyone can pick up and play in terms of the gameplay. And I think most people can make it through. Uh, Yeah. Except for stage three. Well, yeah, I would say it'll definitely it takes practice. Like you can, you can sure. easily get through, like I said, probably at the very least the first level, that one's almost a no brainer, but getting, getting through maybe the first two levels is not a big ask, but yeah, things really, there, there's a hard skill check, I think on, on yeah. level three, like we said, and, and, and yeah, the, the one thing about the controls, like you said, with them being sort of stiff is that you will find, I think regardless of which version you're playing, you, you will find that there are times where maybe you react quickly and you press the d-pad to like turn around to try to hit something and it's either a skipped input or it's just it's not as responsive as you'd want it to be and there are just some times where that will happen where you get just a a fraction of a second of a delay or a missed input or something like that and that'll totally hose you up because you have to be very precise especially in in the later levels but yeah outside of that it's it's definitely doable if you want to put the time in so with that being said let's move into how this game presents itself visually and i gotta say i'm trying to put myself in the mindset of 1990 1988 because today if this had come out like today no one would give a shit true just being blunt because the the purpose of this game just seems to be as gory and as gross and as weird as possible. And considering the time that this game came out, considering the hardware that this game came out on, I think it did an absolutely fantastic job. I still think a lot of these enemies and creatures look appropriately disgusting with a high amount of detail that I do believe, especially back then, was exceptional. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and granted, like, you know, like I said, I was playing the arcade version. So obviously that's going to have higher fidelity and all that than you would yeah. see on a, on a home console around the same time. But but even the ports, I think, translate pretty well. Um, but yeah, this this game still well, it will stretch the definition of good because it really de- <laughs> depends on what yeah. your take <laughs> is on on the, the style here. But I will say that it still looks really good. It is very much that, you know, practical effects, body horror, like Hellraiser, dude under the floorboards kind of shit. And that's what this game is. Like right from the get, you see like, you know, torn apart, emaciated corpses and half bodies that are still like animated and trying to reach out to you from like the background of the level and Mm -hmm. just everything you can imagine. It's just it is chock full of of gory visuals but they're they're all done so well that like it's impressive to me that like i said even today you know when we're i would argue generally pretty desensitized to this stuff especially with you know crisp 3d graphics presenting us with all new kinds of high def horrors and whatnot that the visuals in this game at times 
can still evoke like a very like visceral gut reaction of just like, oh, damn, because <laughs> that's exactly like I was saying earlier, like that transformation animation for when Jennifer turns into the the demon form of her, or the zombie, whatever you want to call it. The boogeyman. Yeah, that is still gross. It still looks so gross, but it's like it's really well done. <laughs> To counter that, for the, the, the console release, of course, it's not going to have as much memory. It's not going to have as much graphical fidelity. Uh, modern players are going to go back and look at this and realize that a lot of the animations were cut out. And they do look very, very cheesy. You'll have maybe two frames of animations for a lot of the things happening in the background. They're supposed to be spooky, and now it kind of looks like they're dancing. So you <laughs> might get more of a chuckle out of it nowadays. I, I do have to stress this. This game is not going to do much for you if you try to judge it from a modern perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'll criticize that fully. I mean, it is a product of its time. But like if you want an example of how detailed and, and weird and gross this game can get, there's I think in stage, I think it's stage four, like even on the screen for the PC Engine version where they intro the, the stage and they show a monster, it looks like a little crawling penis or a melted person that moves around the ground like a slug. <laughs> and that just looks so weird and disturbing. Mm -hmm. Like whoever designed that out of their head cannon, that is just it's great. It probably is ripping off something that I can't think of at the moment. But when you can see a game do this and like especially the final boss and how that's like just a, the, a face full of flesh. And I, I realize that in North America, we didn't get a lot of that here anyway. So there's probably more of that in Japan or other territories. But it's it's still gross, as you said, like it still has this this visceral stuff like, oh, I am in in the womb level like I am in in a body like this is this is a body. This is all like organs and shit like this is very it's very fleshy mm -hmm. and the ability to pull that off is, is cool. But today it is kind of funny because even you said when Jennifer turns into the monster in the arcade version, I need to look at the arcade version, but in the turbo graphics, she like flashes. So she like flashes into the next form and flashes into another one. There's only three fr frames of animation for her to turn into the boogeyman. And so it, you'll probably chuckle a little bit when you see it. Cause like, Oh, this is so lame, but that was a big deal back then. But yeah, today it's not as good uh, <laughs> just to, to be very frank. So I do want to put that against the arcade version. If the arcade version was a lot more fluid in its execution. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. And I mean, I think this is going to factor into my final thoughts about the game once we get to that. But yeah, but yeah I mean, pl playing the arcade version, I definitely feel like I got the, the best possible experience uh, from Sl Splatterhouse because a lot of like you said, a lot of the animations are way more fluid. The detail level is higher. That one particular transformation is way more involved. Like you see her skin like splitting and blood coming Oof. out. Like every single time she transforms that happens and it, it's just super gnarly. So definitely I think the superior experience, at least on that front. Yep. Let's move into the music and the sound here. I'll let you kick this one off. What'd you think of it? I thought it was good. I think it was definitely thematically appropriate as, as far as the music goes. I didn't really have any gripes there. I, I won't say that I thought it was like amazing or, or anything like that, but I think it did its job well. I think it fit the game. I will say that there was a weird choice because and I'm only pointing this out because it's just stuck out to me, which is during the, the final boss fight against the, the hell chaos giant flesh zombie thingy. Mm -hmm. The track was like weirdly like chill like I, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it you have to listen to it mm. but like it, it just it it didn't feel like it fit like it didn't feel like it fit a a final horror boss encounter to me like it seemed very very odd it was an odd choice huh. other than that I thought everything was was fine I will say and again I don't know if this was different in the console version but in the arcade version, at least, I absolutely hate the sound effects uh, of the cleaver hitting an enemy because it doesn't hmm. sound like a cleaver. It just sounds like a baseball bat. Yeah, that's I would say that's also the case. I don't know what the difference is. I haven't cut anyone up with the cleaver lately, 
uh, and, and to compare it with the baseball bat. I mean, I'm sure it would still make a thud, wouldn't it? Or like, are well, you looking for more of a splat yeah, sound? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for more of like a, a meaty like squish. Like, there's there's a difference in, uh, in like the foley work, right? Of like, if you've got a two by four or a baseball bat, then yeah, that that like thwack sound that the game has totally makes sense. That fits. Yeah. But if you're swinging against somebody with this big ass cleaver blade, you are going to get a thwack, but it's not going to be that like higher register, like, like wood hitting a solid object thwack. It's going to be more of like a, a deeper bassy thud, but like with some squishiness, you know, and like it didn't have that. And it like, you get that right off on the first level you pick up the cleaver and as soon as i swung at the first like zombie dude that came at me and i heard this babe ruth ass home run sound i was just like this doesn't fit this is really weird <laughs> that's probably why they changed it to a wood plank in the in the console version do you only get a wood plank you get a cleaver against the uh the upside down cross with the zombie heads floating around it that's when you get the cleaver oh but that's the only time you get I'm it i'm pretty sure that's the only time you get it yeah oh weird okay yeah no you get the cleaver a couple of times throughout the arcade version and it's the first weapon that you get and yeah it just it shares the same sound effect as like the the two by four which is strange yeah i can't speak to that i I will say that i wish it was there when you had the spears Mm. because the spear too i wanted something a little bit more visible when you threw it especially at those monsters that like hang and like when you kill them their guts fall out Mm -hmm. and all that shit yeah or just in general when you see like other monsters like i want to hear that squishiness it looks like it should be squishy yeah and it sounds more like a thud Exactly. That I can agree with. Yeah. Musically, I, I, I liked the final track against the boss. I felt like it did fit. I thought it made it feel epic. I'd have to go back and listen to it and I have to compare. Well, now, again, maybe I need to because I honestly don't know. I don't know if there were differences in the music between like sure. versions. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Other than that, I felt like in the console version, the music like it was appropriate. It was creepy. It was very I think it was aiming more for an atmospheric tone. And I think it did a very good job, but I, I do think, again, this is one of those things you, you go back and you listen to it. It's the, the sound quality is lower and I don't know if that makes it better or worse. It was working with, you know, the Turbo Graphics's sound chip, which isn't considered to be the best, even though there were some great tunes that come out of the Turbo Graphics, but it was trying to do its best to be atmospheric with sounds that definitely sound like chip tunes. So there is some distortion, which does add to the creepy vibes but at the same time it's it it, mm, i don't know i feel like they did the best they could and i feel like it's still decent but it's not anything that you're going to really remember like stage one is just it's kind of faster paced and it's kind of creepy but it it doesn't really hold up as well today but other than that i do think it's it's a good overall sound direction it's a good overall production that they did here it's just again this is one of those things that with time unlike a lot of like nes games and even some genesis games i don't think this one has held up the best in terms of its its overall sound yeah i think i would agree i was also just double checking the list of changes that were made to the ports for the pc engine and turbo graphics 16 and it doesn't mention anything Mm -hmm. about any significant changes to the music so maybe Maybe that one's just a, a personal preference thing. I will say one other thing that I think you missed out on playing on the console version is uh, that womb boss at the end of stage six. In the arcade version, when you kill it, it like spills all of its like guts and fluid and stuff out. And apparently Ooh. in the uh, arc- in the uh, console version, it's just like a generic fiery explosion. Yes, yeah, it, it explodes. Yeah. <laughs> like... I love it. <laughs> that like early 90s video game logic of just everything yeah. explodes. Everything explodes. It just like there's a bomb in everything. Why not? <laughs> when people die, they explode into a big ball of fire. That's right. That's how the world works. In a world full of rotting, gut spilling, flesh separating monsters, there's an explosion. That's right. <laughs> Be the explosion that you want to see in the world. It has reached a higher plane. (laughs) And speaking of reaching a higher plane, Hmm. we are going into our patron pontifications where our patrons get to inform us what they thought of our game du jour. And you, too, can provide your opinions on games in upcoming episodes. And it's an easy three step process. One, become a patron over at Patreon.com. 
Links are in our link tree that will be there at the end of the episode, and you can join for as little as $1 a month. Two, join our Discord. And three, find our patron pontification section, and we will have what game is coming up next that we'll be recording, and you can provide what you think of that game, and you can be quoted in this episode, much like our friend Adam from The Good, The Bad, and The Backlog, fantastic podcast. Adam says, Splatterhouse is a wonderful game with an engrossing and compelling storyline, top-notch graphics, sound that makes the soul sing, and gameplay even grandma would love. Truly an amazing experience and a cultural reset. Life was awful before Splatterhouse came to be. I believe that is what they call taking the piss. (laughs) I'm glad you love Splatterhouse this much, Adam. I cannot wait to watch you play through this. I'm sure that you did as a child in the womb, like a fetus that you beat up in a stage of this game. All right. Well, next up, we have the one and only Masked Keaton, who says Splatterhouse does all the little things perfectly. Enemies have different death animations depending on which weapon killed them. The levels have branching paths, which is true. We didn't even mention that, but that is true. We didn't, no. The backgrounds have great details. The game only needed spooky graphics to be its selling point, but it did so much more. Hmm. All right, next we have Thunderdome Gaming Society, a.k.a. the Disgruntled Gamer, and he says Splatterhouse hit different when you first see it back in the day. A friend of mine had a TurboGrafx-16 and said we should check this game out. As the group of us loved playing beat-em-ups together, we took turns on this one and finished it over the weekend. It'll always stick out because even though the game had some cheap hits on the player, the graphics and animations would encourage us to play through to the end. Years later, realizing that the arcade version is different from the console release, they're both fun to play through. Next up, we have Storm Beagle, who says, I've only played a little of Splatterhouse 2, but man, is that game gorgeous. Over-the-top gore is always fun, especially in the 8- and 16-bit eras when that wasn't so common. It's a pretty tough game, but one I think I'd like to go back to and play around with a bit more. All right, next is Keith from the Main Quest podcast, and Keith says, Splatterhouse is one of my favorite games to play for the TurboGrafx-16, and a cabinet I revisit whenever I go to the local barcade. I want to know what that is. Yeah, we, we need pictures, Keith. Yes. The sprites still look great, and bashing the monsters with a rigid plank, giggity, is always satisfying when they splatter against the background or spill their guts in front of the player character. I appreciate the difficulty curve now more than I did back then, and I wish the sound design and music was a little better than what we have. But I still love the OG Splatterhouse. And last but certainly not least, we have Dischimera from Game Over Hell, and he says... Normally, I don't fancy gory visuals in video games, but something about it in Splatterhouse just makes it work. This game is one of the purest forms of arcade side-scrolling action you can have in a console that doesn't have a shortage of arcade games. It's also short, so perfect for players who don't mind having to try and try again from the start, which you probably will. Yes. All right. Thank you to all our patrons for providing their pontifications. We look forward to what you're going to pontificate on next episode. Before we get to our final thoughts, I just wanted to point something out here in in miscellaneous really quick because I thought it was funny. This game was released in 1990, really before all those parental advisory like stickers came out or they were just starting to pop about or they were fairly uncommon unless it was very violent. And so NEC, when they were marketing this game, They decided to put on a little faux parental advisory sticker on Splatterhouse. And this is what this said. The horrifying theme of this game may be inappropriate for young children and cowards. (laughs) And I could only imagine this was to capitalize on the freak out this game they thought it would generate. Yeah, they're just they're just calling you out, man. Coward. You're not a coward. You'll play Splatterhouse, won't you? Of course you will. You're not a coward. Now give us $50. Yes. All right. Well, with that, that brings us to the final portion of our discussion, which, of course, is whether or not Splatterhouse holds up today. If someone were to sit down with this game and, and fire it up, are they going to have a good time? Are they going to enjoy it? Is, it? is it worth taking the time out of your busy day to play some Splatterhouse? And I'm going to pass that over to Chris first. So, Chris, what do you think? Do you think Splatterhouse is still a worthy contender in the year 2023? So 
let me let me kind of go over this again. I think I think the graphics are really good, especially for the time period. I think it's delightfully gory. I love that. The sound could be better. Keith Keith said the same thing as Montification, as we said earlier in the episode. But those controls, man, those controls. And I understand the game is is simple and maybe it's a little too simple. And I think on the turbo graphics, like I said, you can get through it, but it's going to be really short. And I think it's going to be unsatisfying to most players. So I have to think to myself, do I like this game? Yes, because I have a ton of nostalgia for it and I, I know how to play it and I know it's kind of upcoming and I think things are cool. But I think as if I was going to give this to someone who had never played it before, considering how far we've come in gaming, and I told them that this game was special and they, they sat down and played it, I think they wouldn't see anything special about it. I think when I look back at it, yes, it was a little bit more than just a gory shock game in 1990 uh, when it came to home consoles. But by 1990, you had a host of games that did this better. I think that you could still find games that do this better. This is a, a, a novelty. It's a delightful novelty. I love this game. But if you're going to ask me whether or not this game holds up today, especially with those stiff controls, especially with bullshit stage three, then I'm going to have to say, no, it, it doesn't. Unfortunately, even though it has so many aspects that are really awesome about it, the design is fantastic and, and I do love it to death. I love so much about this game, but it's really hard to recommend to anybody in current year, uh, especially with just what other op- options are available especially during that time frame. So I'm going to have to say no. I'm I'm kind of surprised by that. I'm not going to lie, especially with your sort of personal background with it, but like I get it. Mm-hmm. And and frankly, I'm actually kind of on the same page. This to me and and I don't have any of the 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 personal experiences to kind of lean on as far as like a bias or anything goes. To me, this is one of those games that I I like in in theory like it's like I like everything about it except playing it <laughs> guess what, yeah well that it makes, makes sense. sense yeah yeah like it's I like the aesthetic I I love the choices they made with it I I love the graphics just the everything about the game I'm into like I would get a poster of the artwork for the arcade cabinet of Splatterhouse or like a vintage splatterhouse t-shirt or something like i would totally be that person but do i think that the gameplay itself holds up well enough to plop it in front of somebody now and be like yeah this is a classic and you should play it and you'll enjoy yourself Uh, no not not really even if the controls weren't as stiff as they are to be fair, I've played games with worse stiff controls. Absolutely. But it's enough to be noticeable. And even if that were to be rectified and maybe some of the bullshitty difficulty things smoothed out a little bit, you're still left with a game that will only maybe take you like 25 minutes. And I know there's at least one of you out there that's like, but Shane, like your favorite game of all time is Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time. And that game's only like a <laughs> half hour long. And I'd be like, yeah, you're right. But I would also argue that Turtles in Time has like infinitely more replayability than this game does. Yeah. Just because of how well it handles and how fun it is to control the turtles and play that game. I am down for playing that game over and over again because it's fun to play. This game has everything going for it except the gameplay, which as a video game, is like the central crux of, uh, you know, whether or not the game, you know, makes it or breaks it. And unfortunately, I just don't think this has aged well at all. So like, if you want to check it out, sure, go ahead. I, it's a hard recommend to even say I would spend a couple bucks on it. Cause like I said, you can spend like six or $7 on the switch and get the arcade archives version, which to me, I think is probably the best experience you're going to get from OG Splatterhouse, I think at this point, unless you're like just a real diehard, like turbo graphics, PC engine fan. Mm -hmm. But even with that, it's hard for me to tell you that this is even worth like the six or $7, which sounds really harsh. I don't mean it to be. It's just, 
like going and watching a long play on YouTube of this is going to give you everything that you would want from this game without the frustration of dealing with the gameplay. Yeah, it's a showpiece. It's a bit of a historical artifact. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And and I think there's a general sentiment that I think Splatterhouse 2 is probably an improvement over this, if I'm not mistaken. So that's what I understand. Yeah, perhaps uh, at some point, maybe in a future spooptober, we may need to check that out. And like I said earlier, I am I am definitely down for for us covering the, the 2010 remake because that thing seems it seems very 2010s. So I'm I'm curious to check that out. It's going to be so much bad fun, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> well, I suppose then that does, in fact, bring us to the conclusion of our discussion today on Splatterhouse. So we we hope you enjoyed this. We hope you uh, were were enjoying your time with us for our very first game of this year's Spooptober. And we we, of course, have another one coming up for you. In, in a couple of weeks from when this releases. And I know, at least for myself, that I will be trying to stream nothing but the spoopiest of games on our Twitch streams for the month of October, uh, as is appropriate, given mm-hmm. the, the reason for the season, which is the spoop. And speaking of Twitch, uh, if you want to find more of the stuff that we've got out there on the internet, if you just happen to find your way here, and perhaps this is your first episode, in which case, Hi. Hello. Hey. We're glad that you're here. We hope you enjoyed yourself. You can check out all of the rest of our stuff in one convenient location. And that happens to be our link tree. So just head on over to linktree slash retro hangover to L I N K T R dot E E slash retro hangover. And uh, you will be presented with a finely curated selection of buttons, which will take you to either this feed for this show or our YouTube channel or perhaps our socials, or the Patreon, or our merch store, if you'd like to support the show in that sort of way, and also our public Discord that Chris mentioned earlier on uh, prior to our pontifications. So uh, it it costs you nothing to get in there. It is is open and free for everyone who wants to join in and just have a good time and and chat about video games and and a bunch of other stuff. We've, We've kind of branched out. We have a whole bunch of channels now. So it is it is a fun place to be. We highly recommend it. Um, of course, we're not biased at all, but, you know, mm-hmm. go, go ahead and go ahead and check it out. Speaking of the, the Twitch and the whatnot, Chris, wh- why don't you give the folks a, a brief rundown on what's going to be happening over there? Yeah. So if you head over to twitch.tv slash retro hangover, you might find us playing spoopy games in October. It's the spoopiest games like Barbie's Dreamhouse Party. Mm. That kind of scary. Uh, that's not a promise, by the way. That's not a promise. That's a joke. <laughs> It's on that record. It's on record now. Oh, I'm going to have to beat that game at some point. I know. Uh, but there's no promises. That's not a promise. But uh, that's over at twitch.tv slash retro hangover at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Sundays. We hope to see you there. All right. Well, with all of that being said, until next time. Play with your is necrophilia a crime against my dead girlfriend joysticks. <laughs> Shane here with a quick message. You know, the one rule Chris and I have always gone by regarding advertisements is this. It has to be something we use and can personally vouch for. If you know me, you know I love coffee. And Bones Coffee Company has been my go-to for home brewing for quite some time now. Their small batch beans come in an impressive variety of flavors like Mint Invaders from Chocolate Space or Electric Unicorn, which I swear tastes exactly like Fruity Pebbles. And the best part? No added sugar or calories involved, just natural flavors infused right into the beans themselves. Build your own sample pack of five four ounce bags to find out which flavors speak to you, or jump in head first with full 12 ounce bags. They've even got K-Cups. Step up your homebrew game with Bones Coffee by visiting bit.ly slash RHP Bones. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash R-H-P-B-O-N-E-S.